Welcome to another CEO Wisdom Podcast. We have Sean Torres with us. He is CEO at Intelcom in Louisiana. We're going to talk about cybersecurity, amongst other things, and uh, bodybuilding in between and a bunch of other topics. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, if you want to start scale, be invited to podcasts like this one. You can go to podfire.com. That's my podcasting agency. And we've um, created a system to book you over 100 uh, interviews per week. Uh, you can do way less than that. Uh, 10 is usually the number, 10 high quality ones. The point is that we monetize podcasts. So usually the, the guests can become clients. You can have sponsors and there's a bunch of other innovative ways to monetize your pod and we're specialized into that. So podbuyer.com for this. Sean, welcome to the pod. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself and about Intelcom? Yeah, sure. Um, a CEO and co-founder of Intelcom. I've been doing this since 2009. Um, you know, we originally had started out as a uh, telecom consulting company uh, wanting to save people money on their cell phone bills and then evolved into a full service tech company uh, specializing in really three different divisions. So we have uh, our voice division, which we have our uh, cloud product called ITC Cloud. Uh, voice over IP product, uh, CCAS, UCAS, uh, full platform. Then we have our security division that does everything from physical security, so cameras and access control across the US, as well as cyber. And then we have our managed service division, which is doing uh, desktop as a service, SOC as a service, and we have a you know full engineering team, um, project team, you know, a lot of, a lot of cloud migrations here recently, migrating clients from uh, physical to cloud. So that's kind of uh, where we are today. Uh, hyper growth over the past uh, two years, but we've never not done more revenue than we did the year before, uh, 14 years in a row. Um, we are 100% uh, independently owned. We are not backed by private equity. Um, so uh, we get to make decisions how and when we want to make them. But uh, that's kind of been the journey, you know, um, about little, just shy of 100 employees. So uh, things are going exceptionally well. Um, but that's kind of, that's kind of, the, uh, I guess, in telecom in a jar, the story's long, but, um, you know, it's, it's a good story. It's pretty interesting to see where we've, how we've gotten to this point uh, compared to where we came from. You know, I, I self-taught myself everything that we know. Uh, from watching YouTube videos, <laughs> um, I don't have any certifications, <laughs> so just hard knocks. Cool. Yeah, very uh, unconventional. I love it. So, hundred employees. Let's estimate that a ten, fifteen million dollar business a year. Uh twenty million this year. Just very just over exciting. 20 so, okay. Well, first basic question. So, how do you keep growing? on a yearly basis granted that last year before that was probably around 15 million the one before yep. that 12 and so forth how do you keep pushing the ball forward especially in the down economy um you know we we've when i started this business back in 2009 we were in a you know one of the biggest recessions that the country's ever had um i was just ignorant to the fact that what was going on right i was a young 24 year old kid that wanted to start my business um, and I just really never paid attention to it. You know, I, I still today um, don't really try to wrap myself up in all that's going on in the economy. Um, you know, we, we stay focused on one thing um, and that's providing, you know, the best client experience and, you know, focusing on growth. Uh, I believe that doubling down in a time like now is when you can really scale um, because we're, we're not vulnerable. We don't have a bunch of debt. Um, so therefore it allows us to be flexible, um, and, and really push the limits when most other companies are having to pull back because they're tied to so much debt. Um, you know, with interest rates going the way they are, it puts a strain in the business, you know, so we've been very liquid. Um, and I think there's a big demand right now in the technology space. Uh, when you look at, uh, the amount of outsourcing that's going on. Um, you know, we've been very heavy in, in co-managed where uh, organizations, they need help, you know, um, and they don't have enough resources internally and they don't have the right uh, processes and procedures to manage that technical staff. 
to understand are they maximizing um you know that those individuals time and a lot of companies they want to hire this swiss army knife right and bring them in and they're going to oh i hired this new it director and they're going to do everything you know uh that's that's impossible this space has changed so much between cyber and cloud and you know just having a, a, a azure guy and individual specialists that can understand how to help these organizations scale and grow uh, is where I see so much opportunity uh, in this space, you know, as well as again, in the cyber, that cyber landscape's constantly changing, you know, so without having the right uh, people in the right seats, it makes it very difficult and a challenge. And if, and I can tell you it's expensive, right. To do it right. Um, but when you can, uh, monetize it and create it into a business, you can spread the cost amongst several organizations and still support them in a way that they feel like they're getting um, the best bang for their buck. So uh, I think we've done a good job maintaining uh, churn. We, you know, our churn has been less than 1%. Uh, it's not perfect, right? Anytime you have growth in an organization, um, I don't ever want to paint the, you know, picture of everything's, you know, just, you know, picture perfect here. But it's, you know, we, we pay attention to it. Um, I'm a very involved owner. You know, I come to work every day. Um, I'm passionate about what we do. I enjoy what I do. You know, so it doesn't really always feel like work. You know, when you when you enjoy what you do, I enjoy coming here every day, um, you know, and helping the people that I get to help daily. First question that I need to ask before getting to all the trove of info you just gave me and asking you a question about that. I had... Um, I believe, yeah, I was the CEO of an economic development uh, council in Louisiana. And I was telling him that I didn't have any CEOs uh, from Louisiana so far on the pod. It's like, why is that? And he pointed towards the not shaky, but very slow growing economic development in uh, Louisiana. So do you feel that has helped you to be in Louisiana or that has been a tad harder for you to develop in that environment? Um, you know, Louisiana is not a, um, a big tech hub. You know, I've had a lot of people ask me like, how do you find talent? Um, how do you keep up with the landscape? You know, we have clients in 27 States. Um, I just, you know, I, it, it, we're not the norm. I would definitely say that. Um, but I don't really try to focus on what's going on around me either. You know, um, I've gone to all these conferences and I network with all these CEOs from these other tech companies and they're not doing what we're doing, you know, um, and they're, they're focusing on certain things, uh, I guess that, that are going to help them improve. Um, we've always focused on, on improvement and change. Um, but it's, it's like, trying to change the tire on the car going a thousand miles an hour. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I would say there's not a huge, there's not a, I, I bet if you did some research and looked at the amount of um, mid-sized businesses in Louisiana, um, it, it's probably a big gap there, right. Compared to like a Texas with Dallas and Houston and San Antonio, you know, um, but I think that people are starting to migrate towards Louisiana in a sense that um, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, there's a lot of open space for growth. Um, and, and I even think even the community we're in, you know, I live in uh, Slidell, Louisiana, which is about 35 minutes outside of New Orleans. And people told me I was crazy to open this company in Slidell, that I would never get any business. Um, I, I guess we proved them wrong, right? Uh, yeah. I, I just, I just, I never got hyper-focused on the the norm, you know, it, who would have thought that, I mean, how many video platforms do we have before Zoom exploded, right? A lot. Um, I think consistency, um, I think putting energy into your business every day is critical. Um, I've never been a complacency guy. It's very difficult for me to get complacent. I think that's a curse too. You know, um, cause sometimes you don't stop and smell the roses and that's caused other issues for me, uh, as, as a leader, but, um, it also is the same curse that continues to drive the business. And, um, this isn't a lifestyle business for me. Um, you know, if I wanted to do that, I could have probably done that a few years ago and just sat back and 
collected checks, but that's not my passion and purpose. Um, you know, I enjoy helping people. I enjoy watching the growth. Uh, I enjoy giving back to the community. Um, and that's just something that, that I've been passionate about. And that's, you know, I come here every day for the people that work here um, and want to make this a better place to work than it is to yesterday. You know, that's all we can do. Right. Then when I look at you, I see patients, I see someone that can face adversity uh, in tough moments. You don't even need to tell me, you know, and um, talking about bodybuilding, you know, I interview lots of CEOs on this podcast and the number one thing that the most constant indicator of success is if they're obsessed with their own body. I've seen so many very um, successful CEOs that either were former athletes or are Ironmans or are just super focused on building their bodies and bodybuilding. You know, it's like packing up muscle, which is a hard thing to do, requires consistency. Some days you feel like shit, uh, your <laughs> whole body hurts and you can't even walk, you know, Um, have you seen that in yourself, that constant mentality of, of 1% better daily and facing adversity through your body and bringing that back to your business? Absolutely, man. You know, I look back to when I got into bodybuilding, um, is really when I had probably, uh, some of the most success and really started to, um, scale a company. Um, you know, I'm a big component our believer in the fact that if you can control what you put in your mouth, you can really control anything. Um, and it takes extreme discipline, um, to get into that level of shape to do bodybuilding. Um, and you know, when you have to wake up day after day, um, and do very intense work and not have any results for a period of time, um, it takes a lot of discipline. You know, a lot of people give up and quit. Um, and then even when you get to a point, you know, along that journey is, is getting ready for a bodybuilding show, you get to a point where like, you actually look really good, right? Um, but you got to go another step further and get into a different level of shape, you know, um, and it gets very uncomfortable. And I think that having that grit And being able to push through that is not something that many people can actually do. Um, and I think it teaches you a lot about in business. You know, I look back to the beginning stages of really, you know, growing the business and I was struggling financially at home. Um, but I had like 850,000 in my checking account at work. Um, but I knew that I couldn't grab that money and fix my situation at home because I knew I was going to need that for the future of what I was trying to build. Um, so I think it goes into that when you think about bodybuilding and like people would look at me and be like, Sean, you're in great shape. Like, why are you still doing an hour and a half on, of cardio on the Stairmaster? And I was like, well, I'm trying to get these striations in my ass. Um, so like, I got to be able to show that, you know, yes, I look great to go to the beach, but to compete at that level uh, on stage with guys that are, that are putting themselves to that same hell, um, you know, you got to just embrace the suck you know, um, and recognize that it's not easy. Um, business isn't easy. I mean, shit, life's not easy, right? Um, we all face things every day that are hard, um, and challenging. Um, but I think the more that you embrace the challenge and realize that you ask for this, you know, there was times going through bodybuilding that I would come home and complain about the situation I was in. And my wife got me one day. because she's like, Sean, like just quit then. Like, you don't have to do this. And I'm like, you know what? She's right. Like, I, I am doing this on purpose. So why am I complaining about my diet? Why am I complaining about the cardio? You know, um, I don't know. It, 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 it's, a, it's a mental thing, right? We all go through it. And we go through those stages of like, how do we control it? Um, and I just, you know, I, I like to look at myself as a very strong-minded individual um, and understand that I'm not patient. I will tell you that. Um, but I can absorb a lot of pain and uh, stress and push through it, you know. Um, well, I think you're applying patience, right? You're probably very patient on a long-term scale of things, but incredibly impatient on a short-term scale of things. Yes. And it's yes. applying 
this technology and this knowledge the, the right way. You know, I call that technology like mental tools, right? Because it's the best technology that we have handy, how to have these mental models, just that most people don't take the time. You also talked about um, complaining, for example, right now I'm, I have four dogs and one of them is really unruly, you know? Uh, I think we fall into patterns of, of in habits of toxicity, which is that, oh, he's, this dog's an idiot, you know? Well, I can just revisit that thinking and show a bit more empathy on that level, oh, he's not having his day right now, and that's fine. Tomorrow will be different. Sometimes we need to stop. We need to delete this old mental model and replace it with a new one. That's how the brain works, you know? And then the next day, you can start applying that new mental model again. It's just like a muscle. You need to sort of train it, but you cannot change the full uh, underlying framework, else you will break, you know, if you change your beliefs and, and all of, of these patterns. So... Um, in your case, what uh, mental models of, of yours that you've seen in the past that did not serve yourself, have you replaced with new ones to scale to that level as a CEO and as a human being and a bodybuilder? Um, you know, it, it, I think you have to, you have to embrace change. Um, you have to understand that just because you did it one way. Um, you know, I think back to my, you know, bodybuilding days, and it's funny you say that because I never really looked at it from this perspective, but now that you say this. Um, you know, the way you get ready for one, one show and then going into the next year, starting to get ready again, um, your body adapts to the way you eat uh, and the changes that you create. So there were times where I had to do extreme amounts of cardio and extreme dieting. And then there was times where I could do less cardio and less dieting and get the same exact results. Um Nine times out of 10, I had to push myself harder, right? Because your body adapts. Um, and it's difficult. It's a challenge. And, and it's stressful because you ask yourself, why did this work this way before? But now it doesn't. And and you have to understand that that's where the change comes into play. Um, and I think business is like that. You know, when you operate your business, you know, and and, and you look at like, I, I look at it, it's a ladder uh, of success. Uh, and it looks like a set of stairs, right? That just climbs up. And a good friend of mine who owns a, you know, a very large organization, it's been a great mentor for me, uh, explained this to me one day, the plateaus are growth and you, you start to hit a ceiling at a certain point and then you have to go through that ceiling. And sometimes it's a little harder to push through. Um, and then your revenue does the same thing. So like, of course, like you go through these phases and it was interesting because like, I remember going from uh, 6 million to 8 million. And then from 8 million to 10 million, two years in a row, we had set a goal to go to 10 million and we missed it. And we finally hit it. And it was like this huge celebration that we hit 10 million. So excited. Um, and then I remember coming back and telling, you know, everybody in the company that we we're going to go to, to 15 million. Um, my CFO looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, he said, Sean, we don't have the pipeline to go to 15 million. And I said, uh, well, I know that, but we're going to operate different this year. Uh, we're going to push. And we're going to get there. And we did 16 and a half million that year. Um, and it was brutal. Right. And we're still probably this year uh, going, going to just, just over 20 million that we're having to adapt to the change and it's causing some strain uh, on the company and even in the culture. Right. Um, Cause the way that people liked it, four years ago, they might not like it the way it is today. And it's different. You know, um, I had a, I had a long conversation with a, with a long-term employee that's been here for, you know, seven years. And she told me, she said, Sean, I wish we could go back to like the way it was four years ago. And I explained to her and I said, well, we can't bring your payback to what it was four years ago. Can we? And she's like, no, absolutely not. I'm like, well, then we have to learn to adapt and embrace the organization we are today. Um, and I asked her, you know, do you trust me? Do you believe in my vision? Um, do you believe in where I'm trying to go and where I'm trying to bring us together? And she said, I do. I said, well, then just, just trust me. You know, I've never steered anyone wrong. Um, I know that some people don't always believe in the vision um, long-term and that's okay. Things will change. Um, it, it, it's inevitable, but you know, it, it, it is a challenge and it is a mental strain 
um, to look at people that were here with you in the beginning stages. And it's like, will they be with you there in the end? Maybe, maybe not. Um, obviously it's my objective to help create that, um, vision for them and help them get the buy-in, but not everybody believes in it, man. And that's okay. You know, uh, I yeah. still believe in where we're trying to go. Yeah. It kind of sucks when people don't believe you because first I think leaders most of the time are the most, most trustworthy folks. They have the track record of bringing people from one side to the other. And usually they're right. You know, like me, when I say it, like, trust me, we're going to go through this. We always fucking go through it, you know, whatever happens. So, and I've had employees not trust it. And I mean, in the end, they don't trust in themselves. So they kind of self discarded themselves because yeah, if they don't trust in a 98% track record, I, I don't know what they will trust in. That being said, I have one last question for you because we're already out of time, um, w which is that we leaders have grown comfortable in discomfort, you know, and uh, some people would refer as their own business, sadly, as almost radioactive. And it's something that they need to sell because they cannot keep on growing in their current uh environments you know and most of the time these businesses are, are funded by the way because they don't have full power for control that is my opinion you have a bootstrap business that is making 20 mil a year um will you decide to reward yourself one day and sell or do you want to scale it pretty much forever um you know it, that's always a tough conversation um when you really think about it you know um we've toyed with the idea of selling um you know I, I do believe at some point we would bring on a strategic partner um, to help scale it and grow it um, today. And even looking at the next three years, there's nothing that they offer to us today that would get us there. Um, we have cash. Um, we have growth. Um we have culture, we have great people, we have a, I have a great leadership team, um, you know, so it's, if I felt like there was something they could give us that would, that would, that would help accelerate it or move it, um, or if I felt like, you know, Charles, that I just wasn't up for the job anymore and I'm not the guy, um, I would be more than happy to uh, step out of the way and allow someone to take this thing to the next level. And look, man, that could happen, Charles. Um, I'm not going to say that. Um, brain, right? I think that we all as leaders um, sometimes feel a fraud. You know, if I would have told you that I would have built a, you know, multi-million dollar organization from the ground up from a perforated business card that I printed from Office Depot, I would have called you a liar. Um but also in the same sentence, believe in myself, right? And and know that I can do whatever I want to do. Um, but I would never stand in the way of the company because of my ego. Um, and, and, I, and I would check myself in a heartbeat because I do re realize that there are a lot of people in this company and a lot more people to come that they rely on my leadership. Um, and I don't need to be the smartest guy in the room, you know? Um, if I ever needed to step out of the way, I would be more than happy to do that. You know, I wouldn't, I've seen a lot of guys ruin their own business by not wanting to get out of the way, you know? Um, and that's not good. You know, I, I have done that personally. I've done that to my own business. Um, and it's not good, you know? Yeah. I mean, isn't that the story of humankind? Like people trying, like indulging way too much and rewarding, we, instead of rewarding themselves like 1% daily, they just go up like and reward themselves 200%. And next thing is is downfall. That's also the history of civilizations that fell, you know, uh, whether it's the Maya Empire, the Romans and everything in between. And who knows, maybe next US, sadly enough, you know, because- Yeah, think right. US, it's happened in the US. I mean, yeah. why do you think that they they apply term limits to the presidential candidates? I mean, power for long periods of time can cause issues, you know? Yeah, indulgence, right? Like US yes. nowadays, like China's using that as a weapon against them, like yes. with TikTok and porn and all of that, it's making humans feel comfortable. And yes. we're seeing all these spoiled kids nowadays. I've seen it, they've worked in my business, you know, and they don't have much ambition. All they want is chill and fun. I don't think that's a way to be happy in life. You know, you need to scale 1% daily and 
to yes. grow out your comfort zone. That's happiness, you know, like after a long workout, being chilling under the, the sun, you know, like after efforts, you know, because if you just reward yourself, the brain gets accustomed to that. And next thing, you know, just downscale the fun out of everything. That's how our neuro uh, pathways are, are built. Um, last question, I promise that time. Uh, how do you reward yourself nowadays uh, with with that cash? You know, like as, as a CEO, you must be paying yourself at least one mil a year. Uh, eventually you have your, your exit. So that, that's your eggs in uh, multiple baskets, sort of. Uh, do you reward yourself with, uh, with cars, with, uh, nice homes? Like what do um, you spend it on? You know, I, I, I have a nice home. I, I have a couple of cars. Uh, I'm a Corvette guy. So I, I do have a, a, a C8. Um, I drove it today for the first time in a while and it felt good to get in it. Right. Um, but you know, I, man, the thing that I think I enjoy the most is it, it, our experiences. Um, I love to go on vacations um, you know, with my friends and, and have different experiences. Uh, you know, I, I love to hunt. I uh, just went to South Africa, uh, with my, with my dad. I took my dad on a, on a trip of a lifetime, um, went to South Africa for three weeks and, uh, we went to Cape town and Hermanus and, you know, did a safari and, you know, did, did, uh, a, a, a seven day hunt. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to Kentucky next month. Uh, on a whitetail hunt with some clients and friends. Um, I just got back from Turks and Caicos and we rented uh, Drake's uh, house uh, and had a big, my, I turned 40. My wife threw me a 40th birthday party and it was incredible. So, um, you know, I, I love doing that. You know, that to me is exciting. Um, I, I, I got a couple of Rolexes and I think I, everybody likes a nice watch. You know, um, I love doing for other people too. I love giving back to the community on uh, doing philanthropy that, that to me feels better than anything, uh, than all the materialistic things is watching. Uh, it was funny. I had an employee talking to me today in the kitchen and he goes, you know, Sean, I'm in this leadership North shore deal. And we were, we were at a facility and they were, they were praising how much you give back to the community. And I didn't realize, um, with com uh, Christian community concern and a few of these other organizations, like you, you give a lot to them. I said, I do. And he, and he said, you don't, ever put that out there. And I said, well, I don't, I don't do that so I can get publicity. Uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm doing that out of the goodness of my heart because, uh, I feel like I'm blessed in a place that I've never thought I would ever imagine being, um, in my life. So to be able to give back to those organizations, um, is incredible to me, you know? So that to me, man, is, is, um, I love, I love materialistic things. I will never, ever, tell you that I don't love material things because I do. Um, but at the same time, I also love giving back to, um, I think you have to have, uh, a vision board and understand what you want more. You know, I want my own plane. I do like to fly private. So, um, why not have big goals? Why not have these, you know, your BHAGs, your personal BHAGs of why can't you have a house in, you know, Miami and Colorado and, you know, why not? You know, if other people do, why can't I do it? You know, we all are, wake up with the same opportunity every day. And um, that's just kind of my motto and how I live my life, you know? Love um, it. Love the flow of it too. You you embrace it, you know, like a lot of people, they, they, they're they like between two chairs and they don't know. Um, and yeah, for the jet, uh, I'm waiting for the Tesla one with... Um, I mean, they already do Starlinks on jets, uh, but yep. yeah, the Starlink integrated one, pretty sure Elon's going to get into that as a jet oh, user himself. Yeah. Um, the Cybertruck looks kind of cool also. I might it pull does. the trigger it on does. that one. Um, love it, dude. Where can people find out more about you? Um, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm heavy on LinkedIn. Uh, I do have an Instagram, uh, Sean Torres, 838, uh, Facebook. You know, again, I'm heavy on social. Um, you know, if anybody ever has questions, uh, I'm, I'm an open book. I am more than willing to take a meeting with anybody, uh, and give advice, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's not always right, <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, some people don't like my opinion either. Cause sometimes I've hurt some people's feelings when they've asked me for their help. You know, I had a guy ask me about scaling his business and, uh, sales. And I, and I asked him, I said, well, you know, who do you, who is your target client? And he told me attorneys. And I said, okay, well, how many attorneys did you call last week? And he told me none. 
And I was like, well, how the hell do you expect to get any business if you're not willing to pick up the phone? Um, and he told me that he's not a sales guy. And I said, well, why haven't you hired one? Um, and, and, and he said, he just looked at me, you know, um, look, you, you got to be comfortable with getting uncomfortable. Uh, I still pick up the phone today. It is the most underutilized tool. Um, and you have to ask for business. Um, you obviously have to bring value, right? But, you know, I told him, I said, well, if you want my advice, uh, I would pick up uh, your computer. I would Google attorneys in your zip code and I would call every one of them and tell them why they should work with you. Um, yeah, basically. And start there, you know, keep it simple. Yeah. Um, I also started that way, by the way. That's still what I recommend to people with list of 5,000 realtors and just picking the shit out of the phone. And next thing I knew at day 10, I had a 6K sitting on my lap. That was 10 years ago. So yes, still works, the most man. efficient uh, method out there. If you're broken, if you don't have any money, you still have a cell phone and internet, right? So <laughs> and a car good one. And, and go walk in the door and shake someone's hand. Talk yeah, yeah. there you go. And for people out there, you know, like if they're starters, they haven't even done sales asking advice from a, a 20, 20 million dollar year CEO might hurt their feelings, you know, so maybe start with, you know, one million dollar CEO or, or whatever. But uh, Sean, thank you for uh, the advice you offered today. People can find you under uh, Sean Torres on LinkedIn, T-O-R-R-E-S. And that was a blast. That was another CEO wisdom podcast.com.